Hello and welcome back to the lecture on chapter 12 from the Isham textbook. Um, we are on page 250, which is where we begin talking about instrument testing. Um, testing scissors for sharpness <clears throat> is one of the things we'll have to do. If you look at the picture on page 250, you'll see what looks like a red and yellow toilet paper roll. This is a, a TheraBand material. It's made for physical therapy, but it's a really good analog for uh, testing scissors. Um, other types of testing we need to do on instruments, and these are all important, but I'm going to highlight the importance of the insulation testing in particular, um, because if a scissors isn't sharp, it's just not going to function right. But if a insulation has a, um, a cut or a nick or a break in the insulation on an energized um, instrument, then the energy, which is intended to go to the tip, the distal tip of the instrument, which is inside the patient, it's going to possibly jump and not make it all the way to the distal tip, which is where it needs to go. And then it could jump uh, perhaps and burn the liver or something like that. And so you, you see it's, it's not to be taken lightly. Insulation should be checked uh, every time on every instrument. Um, other things that we should do is uh, demagnetize. Demagnetize needle holders in particular. So what happens is there's a magnet sitting on the sterile field that the doctor uses. He'll, he'll take his needle holder and he'll, he'll place it on the magnet. It's a sterile magnet, don't worry. Um, and it keeps it close to his hand and it doesn't let it allow, uh, allow it to fall on the floor. Uh, the, needle holder will become magnetized. And so we, it's on us to make sure that it's demagnetized before we put it into a set or pack it and sterilize it. Um, and it's important to do this because imagine you're trying to sew with a magnetic needle holder and the needle just doesn't let go, okay. Well, they're doing open heart surgeries or brain surgeries and they're being frustrated because we didn't demagnetize the needle holder. There are many tools for inspection. Magnification devices, uh, get your own, get a little loop. You can order a little jeweler's loop on Amazon. It's a very handy tool to have. If you don't wanna do that, uh, that's fine. Um, other useful things that should be in the department are magnification devices, maybe handheld, you know, a little magnifying glass, like the kind that you used to tour trans with, or a uh, table mounted magnifier. Excuse me, there are magnifiers that uh, you can place an instrument under it and then look at the image on a computer screen like this one. Okay. Um, Identifying instruments. Look at page 251. It shows a little picture where it says instrument identification, then it shows four different types of identifiers on instruments. Okay, so that there's a little readable, scannable code. Uh, there's etching and tape. This is generally, uh, the etching comes from the factory and it'll have the name of the instrument or at least the name of the company and, and a catalog number printed on the instrument. Um, you can have other scannable uh, barcodes, linear barcodes that are not the square little QR codes, uh, or you may have the necessary evil. I'd like to see it as an unnecessary evil someday soon, um, but the instrument marking tape, which is, and I say evil because of the, uh, the amount of work there is in, in maintaining this tape. You can't just put tape on something and then forget about it, but that's a topic, uh, a greater topic in chapter 10. We're moving over to page 252. Um, these bullet points that started on page 251 um, don't overcrowd holding trays. If you put too much metal into, too, into a small place, you have density. So the maximum weight for a tray, uh, with or without a container, is 25 pounds, that is it. And you can still have an overly dense tray. Let's say you took a 20 pounds worth of instruments and you put it in a tray that was too small for it. You have too much metal mass in a small space. And this is a very 
good way to cause sterilization failure if that's what you're into, but that's not what you're into. You're, you're, you're into um, causing sterilization, not sterilization failure. So um, moving on, don't create an overweight tray. Nancy Amy ST77 says containment devices for reasonable medical devices is sterilization and ANSI Amy ST79 comprehensive guide to seam sterilization both recommend a maximum tray weight of 25 pounds. So if you're going to wrap the tray, um, consider that if it weighs 25 pounds, the, the wrap itself does have some weight to it. Um, if it weighs 25 pounds and then you put it into a seven pound container, you've exceeded the weight by seven pounds. So the maximum weight can uh, has to be whether containerized or wrapped, it has to be 25 pounds. Of course, instruments should be protected from damage. One method of doing that is shown here at the top of page 252 using silicon finger mats. So it shows correct and then incorrect. So if you're looking at the correct side, those holes that you see in the bottom of the mat, they go, there's also corresponding and matching holes in the plastic container itself. Those holes are for uh, air removal and um, sterilant entrance and then uh, subsequently the removal of the sterilant at the end of the cycle. If you're blocking the holes, it's going to cause the air to not be able to be removed from the tray um, and probably likely cause sterilization failure and or a wet pack because you're not able to remove all the moisture from the set. <clears throat> There's a picture where it says, do not overload trays. I'm sorry, it is a pretty poor picture, uh, but that's an overloaded tray. You know, there's just too much metal in that, in that, such a small area. Okay, here you see a picture of a technician. She's loaning weight, uh, she's weighing loaner sets. So a loaner set is an instrument set that comes in from uh, an outside company Let's say uh, Dr. Dr. Lorraine, she's going to do an orthopedic case. And um, there's particular instruments that are needed for that case. And so a vendor from a company like Stryker or DJO, they will be contacted uh, usually by the doctor's uh, scheduler. And they will bring in sets to the hospital that don't belong to the hospital but they belong to the company DJO or whoever the company is. So they bring in the sets, let's say eight of them. We have to make sure that when we check them in, that everything's in there. Oh, that we have the instructions for use on how to clean and sterilize them, that everything that's supposed to be in the set is in the set. It's a good idea to go through these sets one by one with the person who's dropping them off. They should uh, leave you with a list of tray contents and verify that everything is there, or if something is missing, that should be documented. But also, she's weighing the sets. So if you should find a tray that weighs 30 pounds, we are not going to break that set up. That is not us. That is the vendor's responsibility to say, I can reconfigure this tray. We can just take these instruments out of it and put them in a separate tray. Um, additionally, those eight trays that were just brought in, if we're going to break up a tray, you now have nine trays. So that's the vendor's responsibility for making that call. Okay, <clears throat> but we are um, back to the topic of protecting instruments. We have to use uh, on some instruments something called a tip protector. A tip protector could be a, uh, a silicon V-shaped item for scissors. It could be just a a broad like square looking thing to put on the end of an osteotome. There are many different fancy looking tip protectors. There's not really great pictures in this book and I'm sorry for that. Um, so tip protectors along with all of these other sterilization products have to be approved by the Food and Drug Administration to be used as um, the intended purpose according to the manufacturer. So things like just the latex tubing that you may have in your department that is approved for other purposes, are, that's not approved to be used as a tip protector. It's simply not. You have to use something that's approved to be used as a tip protector. Um, 
Okay, so still on page 253, there's still some examples of tip protectors. Personally, I really hate the foam ones where it says the foam ones um, because the teeth and forceps and things, they get snagged in there. And some of the instruments that require tip protectors are literally hooks. So imagine the people in the OR trying to pull literally a hook out of a piece of foam. Um, so if I'm ever in a position to do the ordering for a hospital central service department, I will never order those. That's my personal preference. Um, but one of the functions that a tip protector might provide is that it holds instruments open in an open position. And this is because instruments like, uh, I don't have anything, scissors. So you have scissors in your house. Go look in your scissors drawer, take a scissors out and open it just a little bit. This is closed. This is open. Um, instruments that have hinges need to be in the open position for sterilization so that um, it exposes the most possible surface area of the instrument to the sterilant. Uh, I want you to look at the picture on page 253 where it shows protect forceps tips. Some forceps are just laying next to each other like this. Um, and then it shows forceps are like this. The reason we don't put forceps in a tray like this is because it can damage the tips, break off the teeth of a forceps. So you never want to do that. It's a good idea to put them in a pouch that's an organizer pouch and it has different little sections for forceps. They're available. All right. When you're doing an instrument tray setup, you will probably be wanting to use wicking material. So a wicking material, I'm gonna take you back to page 252, the silicon mats. Now those are decent for protecting instruments from sliding around inside the tray or just holding them up off of the bottom of the tray, but they don't provide wicking. So honestly, I've used silicon mats in a lot of trays and I think they're more harm than good and let me tell you why. Uh, they get cuts, they get little micro abrasions, and they can shelter bacteria, but also they don't dry worth a darn. And so <clears throat> you have to hand dry the tray liner before you can put it back in the tray. Okay. Wicking materials, the purpose of a wicking material is um, as an Proved absorbent material that allows for air removal and steam penetration and facilitates drying. So back in the days of the Wild West, when it was like uh, anything goes, uh, we would use uh, huck towels, they called them huck towels for wicking uh, inside trays. Okay, so I say Wild West because we're kind of coming out of an era when things were not uh, okay here let me put it this way best practices are always improving what's what's going on with my hair uh, okay best practices are always improving so it is not a best practice to use a huck towel a reusable or a disposable huck towel <clears throat> inside of a set because these items can cause uh, little fibers or, or lint to be deposited on instruments inside the tray. <sighs> so wicking, the purpose of wicking is to pull moisture away, but also to add cushioning. Um, and also wicking can help to, to keep things like basin sets, to keep the, the metal from suctioning together. I don't even know if you can, ah, how about we use this? Two Tupperwares that are the same size, put one inside the other, and then go and separate them. You see how they, they get kind of tight? So if you had put a uh, paper towel between them, it would be much better. And a paper towel would also allow for the air to be removed uh, more efficiently and the steam to be um, in, into that space between the two Tupperwares, but, and then also for the drying so that the, uh, wicking material literally will pull moisture off of the metal or the plastic or the things inside the container. Something you should not use for wicking, and there's a couple of reasons for this, is you should not use gauze. Gauze, as well as hug towels, can leave um, 
the lint, little fibers behind, which can be bad for the patient, as we learned in an earlier portion of this lecture, that lint can contain bacteria and shelter bacteria through the process of sterilization. Um, lint can also cause things like blood clots, so we don't want to. Okay, so let's do what's right by the patient and not give them blood clots or infections. <clears throat> oh, another reason you should not use gauze sponges as wicking material is, uh, let me let you in on a little secret. So if you're working in the OR um, and the nurse opens for you a 10 pack of four by four gauze squares, okay, you have to count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. So if the count is off by one, either way, that whole pack is garbage. The count in the OR has to be 100% accurate. So if they expect to find 10 gauze sponges at the end of the surgery, but there was one or two hidden inside the tray that you used for wicking, this could end up with a gauze sponge being left inside of a patient after the doctor closes. Uh, have we ever heard of something like that happening? How do you think these things happen? Well, sometimes it might be something we did. Okay. So after you do instrument tray set up for a while, can I just turn pink, you guys? <laughs> They can't even give me any feedback. I mean, it's not live. Okay. <clears throat> um, <laughs> okay. You will become very familiar with some instrument sets. Some instrument sets will be your favorite, and you will be proud of the fact that you can actually, from memory, assemble those instrument trays. Never rely on your memory to do that. Not because your memory is not good, but because what if uh, you were on vacation and they changed a count sheet and they added something or subtracted something or they changed something entirely. Let's just say they added something for a new doctor that he's gonna need every time he does this particular case. So you didn't put it in there because you were relying on your memory instead of going by the count sheet. Now the doctor doesn't have it. Um, sometimes communication on things like this does fall uh, by the wayside. So no matter how good your memory is, also consult the count sheet or the recipe as you call it um, to make sure that you have the correct instruments and the correct numbers. Okay. I am on page uh, 255 looking at the bottom. And flipping over to 256, are you following along? Good. Um, single instruments. A single instrument could be uh, one single Kelly clamp or one Mayo needle holder. Okay, those would commonly be peel pouch in a paper plastic pouch because they're lightweight. A single instrument could also be a uh, a large Harrington retractor, which is about this big. You wouldn't peel pouch that because it's very big and bulky and heavy. You would wrap it. We call it a single instrument. But something that I know because I've worked in several hospitals is we always call those single instruments peel packs because the majority of the items are going into a peel pack. And even if it's a Deaver or a Harrington, we call it the peel pack. Hey, can you go do your peel packs now so we can get this done? Um, but it's a single instrument. And to add confusion on top of that, what if you have a six pack of Kelly's? There is such a thing. I've experienced it in two different hospitals, six pack of Kelly's. Um, I think this is generally when the doctor is gonna use them as suture tags, they want six of them. So they're color coded with some different uh, necessary evil tape. And even though it is a six pack of Kelly's, it is simply six Kelly clamps without a count sheet or recipe. So it is considered to be a single item usually. And you can 
uh, you can wrap something like that. Um, but I'm not telling you how your facility is going to do it or want you to do it. Go with, uh, when in Rome, do what the Romans do, right? If they want you to peel pack a six pack of Kelly's, then that's what you'll probably end up doing. Okay, I'm gonna leave off here before we start talking about quality assurance measures, internal chemical indicators, and external indicators. Uh, thank you for attending this lecture, and I will see you on part three.